Hi, this is John Romano, and uh, this is my lecture, End of the Middle Ages and Their Legacy. It is the final lecture in my course on medieval history. Now, when we're talking about the end of the Middle Ages, we're in fact um, talking about, in part, a uh, traditional date around 1453, uh, but um, perhaps even more importantly than that, uh, what we're talking about is a series of new developments. So what we're going to view today is uh, what are those new developments that signal that something new is beginning to happen uh, in Western Europe? And uh, on top of that, what of all the things that happened uh, in the Middle Ages are carried out most uh, to uh, as uh, their legacy uh, beyond this period? The first thing uh, to take note of uh, at the end of this period of the Middle Ages is new technology. And uh, this comes particularly in the form of improved shipbuilding technology. Uh, and uh, in particular, this form referred to as a caravel. Uh, it has um, a rudder in the stern, um, allowing you to be able to steer the ship. Uh, use two masts, uh, one of which has flexible sails, and you could actually sail against the wind. Uh, it has a large cargo capacity, uh, and um, altogether, uh, it, the crew that was acquired for a caravel uh, was lesser than previous ships, which meant uh, that the ship was more efficient and more profitable. Uh, here's a modern example of uh, uh, trying to uh, build a caravel. On top of that, Western Europeans in this period begin to adapt the compass, uh, which is an absolutely essential tool uh, to tell you in what direction you are headed. Uh, especially important, again, as uh, you travel into the high seas, as so many will do uh, in the next period. Europeans will also start to use what is referred to as a quadrant. Uh, which is used to measure the angle of the sun, which in turn allows you to determine your latitude. Uh, and uh, we also see, uh, very important, uh, is that the development of cart cartography, the ability to make accurate ships based upon um, these, these measurements that were taken as people begin to set out uh, for sea. So turns what it would have been a very standard looking medieval map like this one, the Hereford map, uh, in which um, you can't usually use it to travel from one place to the next, uh, to something that looks like a world that we can actually begin to navigate. Uh, and uh, of course, including places like, for instance, uh, eventually the New World uh, and uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which essentially had been quite literally off the map previously in medieval Europe. This, in turn, these new developments would lead to the Age of Discovery, uh, which really uh, extends far beyond the period we're talking about today. And a teeny little Portugal uh, begins to, first of all, uh, ex explore West Africa uh, for trade in uh, things like uh, certain metals, um, copper, salt, um, gold also, and uh, in fact, uh, it's not just Portugal in time that begins to discover uh, Africa for its um, its precious metals like gold. Uh, and uh, in effect, um, this actually becomes more intensive uh, as Europeans begin to emerge from the economic crisis at the end of the Middle Ages. Uh, and uh, really, in, in some ways, this would be just the beginning of um, uh, the trade in African slaves. Uh, that uh, first starts in Mediterranean Europe, uh, but then becomes a, a much greater uh, uh, degree uh, in, um, in the New World. Uh, the success of the journeys by the Portuguese uh, would lead Spain to get into the game of exploration. Uh, and in particular, of course, the Spanish crown would end up employing a sailor from the Italian city of Genoa, which had a long tradition of um, uh, of being of being merchants and traveling into the east, uh, and uh, Christopher Columbus would uh, go um, would go to the uh, from the Canary Islands to the Dominican Republic, what today is the Dominican Republic, uh, and then he would travel around uh, the uh, Caribbean. 
Uh, it was, quite frankly, unknown what Columbus had first discovered. Uh, but um, because of this new marine technology, with increasingly trained sailors, um, we see that, uh, that these explorers could map out these new lands, uh, they could report on their discoveries, and they could very efficiently manage to exploit these new territories uh, for the benefit of Western Europe. Between the 14th and 15th century, too, we also see the development of weaponry. Uh, and uh, gunpowder is going to become far deadlier in Western Europe than it had ever been previously uh, in, uh, in the East. Uh, they're going to uh, experiment in Europe with uh, new ingredients and purify and refine gunpowder to make it more deadly. Now, we're also going to see now the development of new weapons. Uh, and in fact, uh, some, very interestingly, some of the people who are responsible um, uh, for especially building some of these new rifles and cannons are initially bell makers. Uh, who had the ability uh, to uh, to cast these things. And uh, there is a period of trial and error why these things become uh, far deadlier. Uh, and uh, really, um, the combination of now having very good, um, uh, very good uh, guns and very good um, cannons meant that um, the armor that people had used throughout the Middle Ages would now really be completely ineffective at stopping anything, uh, and so um, it really uh, the old uh, uh, the the old city walls that used to surround almost all of the cities in Western Europe, uh, they really could not stop cannons any longer, uh, and so in, in many cases there's very little point in having them. Eventually, they would just be ripped up normally, uh, and we also think uh, that increasingly uh, these weapons. Uh, would completely upend any any idea uh, of chivalry and um, how one as a true knight was supposed to fight with one another. I mean, what, what chance did chivalry have in the face of a bullet? Toward the end of the, the Middle Ages into the the uh, the next period too, we're going to be, begin to see that paper, which had initially been an invention, uh, in China is going to spread, uh, and uh, eventually uh, this was going to compete successfully uh, with manuscripts, uh, the parchment of which uh, had been taken from animals. Uh, and uh, going along with the spread of paper, of course, there was the invention of the printing press in Western Europe. Um, and uh, really, uh, what was uh, important here uh, is that um, now, although this had um, existed in China uh, as early as the 11th century, it had taken quite some time to reach Europe. Uh, and uh, really, uh, printing initially was simply uh, often used to reproduce certain uh, pictures, uh, many of them uh, religious in nature, uh, devotional. Uh, the person who, of course, is always seen as a, one of uh, the, the real innovators here is this man pictured here, Johannes Gutenberg, uh, who was a silversmith from the German city of Mainz. Uh, and uh, he was the one who managed to bring together the die uh, and uh, the, the matrix, which was the bed in which the die was placed, and uh, the lead uh, for a durable typeface. And uh, really all these together um, using a movable type, uh, then he was able to begin to print books. Uh, and uh, the most famous of these, of course, was a Bible, the Gutenberg Bible, uh, that was produced in the Gothic font that was uh, really intended to imitate uh, the, the uh, writing on a manuscript because uh, that would be the only way he figured it would be popular at all. Henceforth, though, uh, books would not simply be something that only the truly elite in Western Europe could afford. Uh, and in fact, now even middle class Europeans could actually have books, um, especially uh, the Bible and other religious literature, but um, all sorts of other things on top of that as well. 
Uh, and uh, really now uh, in time, uh, most European cities are going to begin to produce their own books uh, and uh, use them to disseminate knowledge. Um, and uh, really, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the if there are two uh, best sellers in early books, uh, first of all, uh, there was a galaxy of religious literature. The other thing is indulgences, uh, which now be created a lot more easily. Now that I speak about indulgences, I should also note that another of the new trends that just really is starting uh, at the end of the Middle Ages are new religious beliefs that start to appear on the horizon, uh, especially uh, those that would will foretell the later Reformation. This included this man who's pictured here, John Huss. Uh, who was an enthusiast for religious reform, um, really um, were doing his work out of what today is the Czech Republic. Uh, Huss taught at the university in Prague, uh, and uh, he really um, re-examines many of the works of John Wycliffe, which had previously been considered heretical. Uh, and uh, a group of individuals who had been interested in church reform uh, would endow a church known as the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague, uh, which served as the center for preaching uh, in this area. Uh, in 1402, Huss would be appointed to this church, and then he became uh, a really a renowned preacher that would draw all kinds of people in. In this role, Huss begins to attack both the wealth and the worldliness of uh, higher clergy. And he begins to emphasize that above all else, scripture should be the essential guide to Christian truth. Huss also felt that communion, the Eucharist, was meant to have a central role in Christian life. And uh, it, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the principal demands that he had was that uh, it should not just be the clergy who received the consecrated wine. It ought to be the lady as well, even though the lady had not received um, the uh, consecrated wine in most places for centuries. Huss also begins to preach versus indulgences. He felt, felt they were useless. The Pope would end up excommunicating Huss and ordered that the Bethlehem Chapel was would be raised. Uh, and uh, Huss ends up retiring uh, to the countryside. Uh, but uh, even then, he cannot uh, in his conscience, continue. Uh, he cannot cease uh, preaching. He continues to do so. And uh, he uh, really appears and preaches to all sorts of uh, Czech peasants. Um, Huss decided, um, rather optimistically believing, uh, that he could convince uh, the Pope and higher clergy that he was right in all of the things he'd been preaching about. And he ends up appearing in person at uh, the Council of Constance, uh, to defend his orthodoxy. Uh, and although the Holy Roman Emperor had given him safe conduct, it was of little worth to him. Uh, Huss was thrown into prison. He was accused of heresy. And even after uh, he uh, uh, was given the invitation to disown his own teachings, he refused. Huss was then degraded from the priesthood and turned over to the secular power, the emperor, who would end up having him burned. Uh, and uh, really, for many people uh, who uh, were in uh, the modern-day Czech Republic, uh, this was extremely foolish. Um, they saw Huss as a beloved preacher, who in fact had been martyred by the very clergy who he had sought uh, earnestly to reform. Uh, and in time, he would actually end up becoming something of a symbol of Czech nationalism, as you can see in the statue here. And uh, many of his friends and supporters really could care less about the specific details about the theology he had, uh, but they felt that um, they had to rally to his side uh, against foreigners. Uh, and uh, really, when uh, Prague, the city, heard about how, treat, how uh, Huss had been treated, they revolted. Uh, and uh, really, um, many people begin to favor the rapid uh, embrace uh, of his reforms, including giving uh, the communion to the lady in both in both forms, uh, giving um, giving everyone the freedom to preach, 
um, and uh, confiscating church property. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, although um, uh, Holy Roman, uh, uh, the emperor, he actually sends an imperial armies against these people, peasant armies will, will defeat them. The reason, of course, uh, that Huss's tale is informative is not just because this was one man's revolt, but many people see him as something of a precursor uh, to, the, to uh, the spiritual positions that Protestants will take a century later. And so um, some people actually see in him already then uh, the beginning of this kind of splintering of uh, Christianity. There are also at the end of the Middle Ages certain new political developments. In this particular course, we have focused on Western Europe, and so we actually have not spoken much about the Byzantine Empire. Uh, but um, we had said that it had been weakened significantly uh, by the Fourth Crusade and uh, the battles that it would end up fighting uh, against people from Western Europe. Um, finally, in the late 14th and 15th century, a group of Turks known as the Ottoman Turks would end up sweeping into Asia Minor and the Balkans. Uh, and uh, then finally, in uh, the uh, the infamous year 1453, uh, Constantinople would fall to Turkish uh, armies. And uh, in fact, this has always been the traditional date for the end of the Middle Ages uh, because of this symbolic event. Um, powerful symbolically because uh, the, the fall of the city of Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire would represent the end of the Roman Empire, this last part, this rump of the Roman Empire uh, that finally had, uh, had dissolved. Uh, and uh, really, altogether, um, we don't think the Byzantines stood much of a chance against the sort of very powerful and well-organized Ottoman Turks uh, who assaulted the city both by sea and by land. Um, and uh, with their armies, and at the same time, uh, huge cannons. Uh, and really, the city walls end up being demolished by these cannons. Um, and uh, really, uh, the, so the last emperor of the, the Byzantines is uh, dies fighting in the streets of the city, and the city would then become the capital of a new Turkish empire, uh, which would uh, have control over the Black Sea and show a lot of influence in Eastern Europe, and it would scare many people in Western Europe who thought the Ottoman Turks uh, would very soon uh, turn to invade them. Um, if there is another influence too that uh, is important for Western Europe, uh, it is that um, Byzantine scholars recognizing uh, what at all was lost, uh, very often what they would do uh, was that they would take uh, precious Greek manuscripts uh, many of them often ones from the ancient world, uh, or texts from the ancient world at the very least, and they would end up escaping into Western Europe. Uh, and there they helped to inspire a new devotion uh, to Greek learning and Greek artistic styles, and above all, of course, in Italy during the Renaissance. Uh, so a lot of their learning would live on. We will not go to it in any great detail, but it is fair to say that uh, in the later Middle Ages and uh, really bleeding over into the early modern period, uh, many people will see that the new wave of the future politically for Western Europe uh, is one in which monarchy grows in power. Uh, and really, um, even at the end of the Middle Ages, we see the distant stirrings of things we might refer to as national monarchies. Uh, and uh, really, in many different places, uh, the authority of royal governments would increase significantly. Uh, and uh, really, um, the, the kings are no longer seen uh, as really having to take uh, to care of people who were their direct vassals, people who had directly uh, sworn an oath of loyalty to them. Um, really, now, uh, kings were seen to be rulers of all the people in a specific land. Uh, and um, they were expected to consider now the common welfare of everyone. Uh, and uh, really, um, the, the subjects of each king felt that they had common interests. 
uh, that they were bound together through their ruler, uh, and um, it, really one could not lightly deny one's allegiance. And uh, people begin to look earnestly to the kings to provide peace and order. All of this, of course, was a far cry uh, from how royal government had looked a few centuries before this. Um, we see uh, this happening certainly in France, in which many formerly independent nobles in France uh, had very little choice at this point, save to subject themselves to the power of the king to live now as his dependents. And in fact, uh, the king would relentlessly move against some nobles, uh, in many cases reducing them to total powerlessness, and in some cases even to poverty uh, because of his strength. Uh, and uh, really, uh, the French king, even at the end of the Middle Ages, was on his way to becoming absolute, um, with a very strong bureaucracy, uh, with a standing army. Uh, these were things that, of course, a medieval king would have loved to have, but uh, they never did. In England, too, um, uh, really toward the end of the Middle Ages, we're going to see that the English will um, undergo a, a spell of civil wars, uh, but when um, they come to an end, uh, we'll end up seeing, again, in England, a strong, stable monarchy. Uh, and if really, uh, interestingly enough, if anything, civil war had convinced everyone uh, that you could not trust nobles. Uh, and um, really, this anti-noble feeling begins to become pervasive. Uh, many people in England wanted a strong monarchy to check the power of independent nobles and to ensure peace. Nevertheless, um, the monarchy in England uh, is never a truly independent creature, in part because of developments we've already discussed. Uh, the idea of having parliaments, parliaments now that uh, the king could not simply hire and fire, but ones that had uh, independent a power uh, to be able to control the purse strings, especially when the king wanted to go and fight foreign wars. Um, this really um, was deeply rooted now. Uh, and uh, at least in theory, the English king um, was supposed to be ruling by the consent of the people. Um, and uh, even as an ideal, of course, this is, um, this is removed from having a king uh, who could do whatever he wanted. We also haven't spent a, a good deal of time in Russia, in part because, in some sense, um, Russia did not, not only did not exist as a nation, uh, but we had said that many of its uh, nobles uh, were highly divided against one another. And it's really not until the second half of the 15th century uh, that we really begin to see something like the beginnings of the modern state of Russia with its capital at Moscow. Uh, and in particular, what we begin to see uh, towards the end of the Middle Ages is a series of revolt uh, by some of the Russian princes against the Mongols, who were still uh, perfectly uh, powerful in this area, uh, you know, against uh, specifically um, the Eastern European holdout of the Mongols known as the Golden Horde. And uh, Russian princes up until this point had owed tribute to them. Uh, and really, um, one family um, uh, had risen to prominence, had once been, uh, once had been a tribute collector for the Russian vassal states, uh, but uh, then would end up breaking off and uh, causing a final successful rebellion against the Mongols. This was the Grand Prince Ivan III, the Great. Uh, and uh, Ivan III would uh, basically subject all other Russian princes to his rule. Um, and uh, uh, he, would, um, uh, he would have a bishop of Moscow as the chief priest now of the Russian Orthodox state on the same model of uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, Ivan himself would marry a Byzantine princess. Uh, and thought himself to be the heir of the Byzantine Empire, uh, referring to Moscow as the third Rome after Constantinople, and the real Rome, of course. And he referred to himself uh, by the Russian term Tsar, which initially comes from Caesar, uh, of course, 
which had originally been um, um, part of Julius Caesar's name, but it had really just come to mean uh, any emperor. Another place in which um, we were beginning to see the stirrings of national monarchy is in Spain. Uh, and uh, in particular between the uh, the marriage between Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabel of Castile in 1469 uh, that would begin to weld the states uh, of, uh, of Spain into one kingdom, leaving out Portugal in the process. Uh, and uh, in fact, creating sort of a, a larger um, Spanish kingdom that could appeal to other areas for tax revenues. And uh, uh, in addition to just this marriage, one of the uh, symbolically most charged moments of this uh, was in the year 1492, uh, when finally uh, in the southern part of Spain, Granada, uh, the, this area, uh, which was the last holdout Muslim state in Spain, would be conquered and then incorporated into the Spanish kingdom. Uh, finally, um, bringing an end to this process of a reconquista uh, that now had really been going on in one form or another for centuries, uh, but uh, permanently casting out uh, the Muslim uh, Muslims who had lived there for so long. All right, if we have some idea now of um, what is changing at the Middle Ages, the other question I promised to answer at least to some degree is what did we get out of it anyway? Uh, what is the legacy of this period? Uh, and I, I do want to suggest to you that uh, really as opposed to this often dismissive attitude toward the Middle Ages uh, that nothing good came out of them, that some people would say that this is a, a dark era, I would say in fact that many Western institutions uh, that we now embrace actually started in the Middle Ages. Uh, and uh, these begin to some degree with technological advancements. And I won't repeat the ones I've already discussed today, uh, but we had discussed earlier uh, that uh, really West, West, medieval Western Europeans, uh, because of the need they had for new land, became excellent at reclaiming land from bogs and forests, and turning these territories into fertile farmland. Uh, and if that really doesn't seem that impressive to you, it's because we're not there on a day-to-day -day basis and the often grinding labor that was necessary uh, to clear a forest, for instance. I mean, it's difficult enough sometimes to chop down one tree, much less turn an entire forest into an area that could be farmed. Uh, and in fact, these methods of agriculture uh, that Europeans devised would make them productive and then would enable them uh, to support a large population. Many people would also say that the profound influence of Christianity is in effect a medieval legacy. Uh, this is not to say, of course, that Christianity did not exist before the, the medieval period, uh, but to really see its, its, uh, its spread and how culturally it begins to define an area, we need to look to the Middle Ages. In some way, uh, the Catholic Church would become the world's first truly international institution. Um, for instance, so, uh, um, when, um, when certain people wanted to start a crusade um, and wanted the, the Pope to declare one, they would uh, the ambassadors would come to him knowing that he, for instance, could get other European leaders on board, or hoping he could. Uh, we see, of course, uh, that the medieval church became involved in religious activism, and really, in some ways, was constantly involved with the affairs of the world. Uh, and um, just how uh, we're tied together the church was with certain humanitarian aims, um, giving the, uh, the poor money, uh, creating hospitals for the sick and the injured. And we also see that, in fact, um, that especially in the later Middle Ages, um, the Christian culture would be uh, in part disseminated, would be deepened by uh, some of these mendicant friars, uh, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, who were able to travel uh, from place to place. 
Perhaps on a slightly more negative note, though, uh, it is fair to say um, that uh, the tension between church and state, a debate that, of course, still persists to this day, is also a legacy of the Middle Ages. And something about, for instance, the investiture crisis that we discussed uh, really encapsulates uh, these uh, these sort of questions that people still ask about, you know, when does, uh, when does religious uh, belief and practice end and the state begin? Um, it was not at all clear to them either. We also see uh, that uh, emerging out of the Latin language that had been used uh, so often in the Roman Empire, uh, we see new Romance languages uh, coming out uh, throughout the Middle Ages. Uh, that were more versatile than Latin and suited uh, to people's new needs. And uh, this really allowed the development of some of the world's great vernacular literature. Uh, not that we've really read it here, but I really do hope uh, elsewhere in your travels, uh, you will, for instance, read Dante's Divine Comedy, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, uh, Beowulf, The Song of Roland. Uh, these are all great classics. Uh, and ones that, of course, emerged from the Middle Ages. One of the other things uh, that the medieval period brought us is what is known as the cult of romantic love. Um, if you think, for instance, that on Valentine's Day it is a rational thing uh, to uh, send your beloved uh, cards and flowers and chocolates, uh, in essence, you are in some degree participating in this uh, in this romantic love, which um, at least for some outside this culture see it as sort of an eccentric inv invention of medieval culture. Uh, and uh, of course, um, romantic love would live long on literature uh, and still for many is widely accepted as a sound basis for the relationship between the sexes, whatever you personally think. We also uh, see that many freedoms um, that we may, um, as Americans, take for granted, those, for instance, in the Bill of Rights, go back to rights uh, that were conceived uh, by medieval townsmen who lived in free towns. Uh, and so reading through um, some of their charters, like this one here, um, you can see that, for instance, um, towns were concerned that uh, People should never be arrested without a warrant. People should be, uh, should be considered innocent until they were proven guilty. Uh, people had the right of bail. Um, people could buy and sell things without undue taxes and restrictions. Uh, people could arm themselves with weapons of their choice. Uh, and in fact, in many in many towns, people had the right to trial of a jury of one's peers. Uh, and this, of course, is not original to the Middle Ages; it existed already in ancient Athens. Uh, but uh, it, it seems that uh, the medieval period rediscovered uh, this right, uh, partially uh, from Viking assemblies, uh, and partially also from certain peasant courts. Some would even go one step further uh, and say uh, that uh, representative government, to some degree, uh, comes from feudal institutions. Uh, and that is not to say that representative government uh, is simply a mirror image of uh, the kind of institutions politically that we've seen in the Middle Ages. But there still are some similarities and you can find some roots. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, there was an emphasis in the Middle Ages on a mutual co mutual contract was the relationship, uh, was the basis, I should say, of the relationship between people who are in authority and their vassals. Um, and uh, we, we had it also, uh, we also saw it together uh, in documents like Magna Carta. Um, we really see that there is this attitude that um, the, the rule of law really binds whoever was charged with authority. Um, and uh, in addition uh, to um, just this idea that um, everyone is under the law, even kings, um, you as a uh, person in charge 
we're supposed to have the consent of the people underneath you to be able to make law. Um, and uh, really, um, there are numerous uh, times in which both vassals and lords defend their rights if they felt their rights were violated. Uh, and this was not going outside the system of I mean, individuals, uh, even in a in feudalism or what lordship, had the right to rectify their wrongs. Um, so to the attitude was that um, the government authority must be limited in some way. Uh, but um, at the same time, the government must bring about uh, some kind of higher goals. Um, these were all ideas uh, that at least had uh, their, uh, their beginnings in the medieval period, even if they wouldn't fully flower until it was done. I might say, too, uh, that um, what is very interesting to us in, in viewing the later medieval period in particular, um, although one might also say the early medieval period, too, um, despite the kinds of challenges that people uh, faced, and we've seen in this course, um, we've seen things like disease, numerous wars, uh, religious debates and schism, um, time periods of economic decline. Uh, and really, um, both, uh, I would say, uh, at the end of the Carolingian Empire uh, and again uh, at, uh, uh, during the Black Death, it really appeared uh, that it, Western Europe would not last as a civilization, uh, that in fact, some of uh, the neighboring civilizations, uh, ones like, for instance, in Islam, the Byzantine Empire, were far stronger in some ways. Um, in spite of all these things, Europeans did not succumb to these problems, uh, but in fact, uh, end up bringing into existence the institutions of the modern world. Uh, and in fact, um, again, really in some ways against what uh, all anticipations, uh, Western Europeans after this period uh, would, uh, would really enter into this new era of expansion uh, and achievement. And, uh, and in fact, um, after the Middle Ages, you know, far from really being this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, insular culture that was under attack, it was now Western Europeans who would in fact go out and start attacking the rest of the world uh, and would start to thoroughly dominate, dominate and remake the world on its own image. And uh, you don't have to be happy about uh, how they did it uh, to really recognize it is an achievement uh, that just as Europeans, uh, for instance, uh, begin to um, uh, begin to attack uh, areas outside of uh, their core lands in Western Europe, and for instance, uh, in the Crusades, um, they will take many of these same exact techniques, and they will take them on the road to the New World. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is why, of course, the world in time will be so thoroughly influenced by Western European models. The last piece of legacy of uh, the, the Middle Ages is one uh, that um, you really know a lot about already because you already have been participating in it and you will maybe continue to do so as well. What we had all said together is that the universities uh, end up growing out of cathedral schools. Uh, and in time, this model is going to become uh, the, one of the standard models for higher education throughout the world. Uh, and um, medieval universities will allow a venue uh, for some of the great thinkers of the medieval world to produce their works. Think, for instance, of uh, Thomas Aquinas, whose work, one of whose works you read uh, in this course. Uh, and in, in many ways, in fact, uh, being professor um, you really, a professor still maintains something uh, of a guild structure to this day, um, where, uh, again, uh, sort of institutions like uh, tenure and something really, in some ways, uh, feel a lot like, more like medieval, um, um, medieval sort of uh, ways of going about things rather than modern ones. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, this is the way, reason why uh, academics still wear academic gowns uh, at a special events. Um, 
we see uh, that in universities uh, there was a set curriculum uh, and um, this was of course the curriculum of the liberal arts uh, and the liberal arts um, gave Europeans who had come from all kinds of different uh, places uh, within Europe common intellectual references and points there was a basis of things to be able to discuss there was a common language uh, there was a common way of thinking uh, and uh, really uh, the liberal arts of course had as its ideal not simply studying a bunch of practical subjects uh, that you could immediately use for a profession uh, the attitude was of course to um, master a group of different subjects that would in the end uh, have the effect of teaching you how to think uh, and uh, really um, the liberal arts was a bet taken uh, by many people who had come from families for instance of knights or merchants um, they were betting on the fact that learning how to think uh, was important enough uh, and would secure the success uh, of um, of uh, the, those who went into it uh, much more than just becoming an apprentice uh, and this of course uh, is still a system in which you have taken part of and uh, really underlies uh, some of the ideals of Benedictine College uh, and it is one of course that we, we proudly embrace and one that really uh, I think uh, to some degree uh, harkens directly back uh, to the medieval past all right that's all. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.